Well, today is the day that has traditionally become known as Palm Sunday. It's the day where the church remembers Jesus' entry into the city of Jerusalem, which ultimately set in motion the final days, the final week of his human life here on earth. And so, in light of that, I'm going to speak to you from uh, that text this morning, talking about that event. But I feel like my uh, appointment by the Holy Spirit is to help you see this event through a certain lens, through a specific perspective. And the title of my message today is The Chosen Lamb. The Chosen Lamb. Would you pray with me this morning? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we get to come together and worship you and feel your presence and now study your scriptures. Pray, O oh God, that it would bring life into this place, Lord, into our hearts, into our minds, into our spirits, that you would speak truth to us, that you would challenge us, convict us, encourage us, Lord, and draw us closer to you as we follow by faith in the direction of eternal life. I pray that you speak to all of us today. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I want to turn your attention to the Gospel of Mark chapter 11. And I want to read to you Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, just so you get the context of, of what we're looking at here this morning um, and why this day is known traditionally as Palm Sunday. Mark chapter 11, verse 1 tells us, Now when they, this is talking about Jesus and his disciples, when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage, and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. And he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. Verse 4, so they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing, loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. Verse 7, then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Verse 11 tells us, And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already laid, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the event that's known, has become known traditionally as Palm Sunday. And there's a lot of debate on the the, this this week of Jesus' life, his what's known as his Passion Week or his week of of suffering. Um, There's a lot of debate as far as um, you know the timing of things, how this week played out. And uh, there's a lot of unknowns with regards to uh, the timing of when he rode in and when he was crucified uh, and how that correlates to our modern Gregorian calendar. Um, Did he really ride into Jerusalem on a Sunday or was it a Monday? Uh, Was he really crucified on a Friday? We're going to have a good Friday service coming up this week and we're going to be talking about Um, the crucifixion in that moment. But was he really crucified on a Friday or was it on a Thursday? Um, With it being the week of Passover, was there there a high Sabbath that week or like a double Sabbath taking place that week? Um, Or was it a typical week with only one Sabbath? There's a ton of debate about this stuff and a lot of it we just don't know the answers to and there's different perspectives um, because uh, our modern calendar is so different than the uh, the ancient uh, lunisolar uh, Jewish calendar. And I'm not really going to get in, into all those debates today, but regardless of all that, we are using this Sunday service today to commemorate the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Now, who cares about that? 
Why would we care about Jesus riding into Jerusalem? Why would we make a special day of that? If you look at all the significant moments in the life of Jesus, you look at some of the teachings and the miracles and uh, raising Lazarus from the dead and um, you know, escaping uh, near-death experiences, all these significant moments, why would we take time to remember this one? Why would we have this traditional uh, title known as Palm Sunday? Jesus riding into Jerusalem and people laying palm branches down on the ground as he rides over them into Jerusalem. Why does this matter? Who cares? I would think if someone's telling the story about one of our lives, um, looking at all the highlights and the significant moments, um, I don't think that they would take a lot of time to remember and celebrate your ride to church this morning. <laughs> or my ride to church this morning. It was pretty uneventful, just driving, arriving here. Why does this moment matter? Well, let me, let me give you a contrast of perspectives this morning that hopefully I'm praying will, will move you and touch you so that you will feel the significance of this ride into the holy city known as Jerusalem. There's two lenses to look through in this event. There's the lens of the people in Jerusalem, the Jewish people. Um, there's a lot of people in Jerusalem at this time because they're celebrating they're one of their biggest feasts of the year, known as Passover. And they're, so they're expected to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover. So the streets are packed with, with people, and they're preparing to celebrate Passover together. You have the Jewish religious leaders who are a part of the community. And it's, so it's their lens, it's their perspective, what they're seeing when Jesus rides in. But there's another perspective, and that's Jesus' perspective. What did he see? when he was riding in to this city. And why is it significant? Let's start with the first one. For the Jewish people who were in Jerusalem, Jesus' ride into the holy city from their vantage point was a processional for their king, their Jewish king. They looked at it like the Jewish king, their Messiah, the Christ. He's coming into town and he's going to take authority and he's going to rule from, from Jerusalem, the holy city, and he's going to reestablish the kingdom in Israel and overthrow the Roman Empire and we're done submitting to other governments. Here comes our king. That's their perspective. Take a look at it. Mark chapter 11 again. Looking at, uh, let's just look at verse 8 through 10. Mark chapter 11, verse 8, it says, As he's riding from Bethany, which is about two miles uh, outside of Jerusalem, it was where he was staying. He was staying in Bethany, but coming into Jerusalem, and then in the evening time, going back out to Bethany. But he's riding in, and verse 8 tells us, As he's riding in, many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches. In John's Gospel, John chapter 12, it says that palm branches, specifically, hence Palm Sunday, cutting down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna, that means save us, save us now. Save us, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Remember, David is the greatest king in Israel's history. He is the, the picture of, of what it means to be a king, and the Messiah will come from the lineage of David. He will be a king in like manner as David. They say, Hosanna, save us in the highest. Verse 11 says that Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So, they, from their perspective, here comes the king. Now keep in mind, Jesus didn't spend a lot of time of his ministry in Jerusalem. Most of his ministry was outside of Jerusalem. He, he was in Galilee. He was in Capernaum. He was in different areas, different regions. A few weeks ago, we were in Mark's gospel, and we looked at the, the instant where he went up to uh, Tyre and Sidon and healed a Syrophoenician woman's daughter. Most of his ministry is outside of Jerusalem. He's healing people. He's working miracles. He's teaching. His fame is spreading. People know about him. Now, all those people made a pilgrimage into Jerusalem. So those people who have had encounters, they've heard the teaching, they know a little bit about him, they're all packed together, a lot of them packed together in Jerusalem for Passover, and they hear Jesus is coming, the miracle worker's coming, the teacher's coming, 
the one who maybe the Christ is coming. He's going to ride into our holy city. So they have these things in mind. Then they also have in their mind some Old Testament historical kings who did likewise. They had Solomon in their mind who, when David made him king, David put him on his own mule and had him ride in a processional format. And people were uh, praising and celebrating and excited about Solomon being their, their king, their next king after David. They would remember back in 2 Kings, uh, I think it's chapter 9, 2 Kings chapter 9, when Jehu became king. The people came out and they laid garments down on, on the ground, on the road. So Jehu would ride, kind of have a red carpet processional, uh, being crowned to be the next king. And so um, they have these things in their mind. They have this, these experiences of seeing Jesus do wonderful works and miracles and teachings. They also have in their mind their past kings. Um, if you look at the intertestamental time period uh, in between the Old and New Testament, there's a time where um, it's recorded in the Apocrypha where the, there's a Maccabean revolt and the, the family, uh, the Maccabean family overthrows the Syrians and reclaims Jerusalem from the Syrians and Simon Maccabe, Maccabus comes riding uh, into the city and they have a very similar processional laying palm branches down, playing music. Here comes the king. We're taking Jerusalem back. So they're imagining this stuff, and Jesus is riding in, and they're thinking, here we go. Here we go. Here comes the king. Also, they have the scripture, the prophetic scripture of the Messiah, Zechariah chapter 9, 9 in their mind, which says this, Zechariah 9, 9, rejoice greatly. This is a prophecy about who the Christ would be. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. And how is he coming? He's just having salvation, lowly, and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So these memories of past Israelite kings, along with prophecies like we read in Zechariah, had these people quoting messianic psalms. Hosanna, save us, come into the city and take it, our king, our Messiah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's what the people of Jerusalem saw. That was the lens that they saw through. And of course, the religious leaders of Jerusalem also saw through this lens. The only difference is they didn't like it. They didn't like him. They weren't happy about it. Where the people were rejoicing, the religious leaders were jealous and envious. The priests and the teachers didn't want Jesus declaring himself to be the king. They saw through the same lens as all the others. They saw it as a declaration. He's riding in. He thinks he's the king. He thinks he's going to be the, 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 the king of Israel. We got this red carpet laid out for him and the people, he's allowing the people to select him and crown him as their king. They saw through the same lens, only they didn't like it. Look at their response over the course of the next few days when Jesus rode in to Jerusalem. Mark chapter 11, let's just look at a few scriptures here. Verse 27 and 28, it says, Then they came again to Jerusalem, and as Jesus was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders came to him, and they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? to do these things. So their response is, what do you think you're doing? Who do you think you are? Where did you get, the, you get this power from? Where did you get this idea from that you're something special? Look at this, moving along through Mark. Mark chapter 12, verse 13. 12 and 13 says, Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. So their goal is to trap him. It's to catch him and prove that he's really not who he's acting like he's... Uh, who he thinks he is. Verse 18 of Mark chapter 12. Then some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and they asked him, saying, and they begin to challenge him. So you have the chief priests, the elders, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees, every religious denomination you can think of in Jerusalem is not happy with this processional uh, into Jerusalem. They're testing him. They're trying him. Verse 28 of Mark chapter 12 says, Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? So once again, another test. 
another quiz, another uh, uh, opportunity to try to challenge him. And it's really summarized in this passage, Luke chapter 22 and verse 2, where it says, And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. The people in Jerusalem understood Jesus' ride into the city as a way of saying, I am your king. And the people loved it. And the religious leaders hated it. On that day, when he rode in, the people chose him as their own. And the priests chose him to die. When he rode in, the people, their perspective was, we choose you. And from the priest's perspective, we choose you to die. This was the lens that the people saw through. They had chosen their king. However, they seemed to forget why it was that so many people had been in Jerusalem to begin with. The streets of Jerusalem were packed because, as I said earlier, it was the time of the Passover, the biggest feast day, the biggest festival or holiday um, in Israel. Every year, the Jewish people were expected to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to commemorate the formation of their nation, how they became a people, why they even exist. Israel first became a nation uh, about 3,500 years ago when God set them free from slavery and from hard bondage. They were slaves. They were a nobody. They were just, you know, tools for, for Egypt to build cities for the pharaohs. But they became a nation because God set them free. He released them from slavery. He released them from bondage. How many know a little something about that? Being released from the bondage of sin. Being released from slavery and, and continuing to follow the lusts of our flesh and the ways of this world. God sets us free. They were trapped for 400 years in bondage with no means to escape. There was nothing they could do in their own power or in their own ability to overpower Egypt, Egypt and be set free. But God brought them a plan of salvation. And if you're hearing this for the first time, this is a crazy plan. This is a, a wild plan. If you could bring up Exodus chapter 12, we'll look at it together. This is just an absolutely wild plan. They're slaves for 400 years in Egypt. They want to be free. God wants them to be free, and he's going to make them into a people. So this is what he tells them. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So he's establishing, you're getting ready to start something new. This is going to be a new beginning for you. This is the month of what's it's now known as the month of Nisan in the Jewish calendar, the month of Nisan. Um, and he says this is going to be the beginning of new things for you. He says, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying on the 10th, everybody say 10th, on the tenth of this month of Nisan, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. So you're going to select a lamb on the tenth of Nisan, and I want to make sure. And, and the Lord saying, I want to make sure you distribute it properly so everybody has what they need. Verse 5, let's read on. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day. Everybody say the 14th. The 14th. So you pick this lamb on the 10th, and it needs to be a male, it needs to be uh, a young uh, lamb, and it needs to you need to make sure that it has no blemishes, no spots, no defects. I don't want you to pick this lamb that's, you know, of no value to you. I don't want you to pick some lamb that's really old and decrepit and there's no, no uh, it's past its, its uh, time of value. No, I want you to pick a lamb that's in its prime. On the 10th, and on the, on the 14th day of the same month of Nisan, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood... This is where it gets weird. Take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. So you're going to kill this lamb, take it on the tent, 
inspect it for the next few days, kill it on the 14th, take its blood, take a paintbrush or something, and put it on the door lintel up above your door and on the doorposts of your house. Then he says, you shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. Finally, verse 11, And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So he says, this is what we're going to do. You've been in slavery. You've been in bondage for over 400 years, Israel. Here's what we're going to do. On the 10th of this month of Nisan, I want you to take a lamb, a specific type of lamb, and then I want you to kill it on the 14th. And I want you to take its blood and put it over your door, over your place of residence. And I want you to take its meat and I want you to eat it. And I want you to dress yourself. I want you to pack your bags. I want you to be completely ready to go because I'm getting ready to set you free from bondage because of this lamb. Now that is a crazy story. That is a wild idea. 400 years of bondage, 400 years of being trapped in an ungodly culture, and God tells them, I'm going to give you a new beginning. I'm going to set you free from all the years of bondage. You're going to pick this lamb on the 10th of Nisan. You're going to select it. You're going to pick it from among the flocks. The lamb has to be perfect. It has to be without blemish, without defect, not too old, not too young. And I want you to inspect that lamb that you've chosen for four days. I want you to choose the lamb on the 10th, and I want you to inspect it for the next few days and kill it on the 14th. When you kill it, take its blood, put it on the outside of your house, put the meat on the inside of your body. Get the blood on the outside and the substance on the inside. And I want you to do this because I'm getting ready to release death into Egypt. I'm going to allow the spirit of death to come through Egypt and kill all the firstborn in Egypt. But anyone who has the lamb's blood on the outside of their house and the substance of the lamb on the inside, that spirit of death, that angel of death, will pass over that house. And that family will be spared from death. When death comes to try to claim the lives of that household, I will force death to pass over those families. And that is how the Jewish people became a nation. That is how they were set free from slavery and directed toward a promised land that they eventually took and became a nation. It's crazy. It's wild. No lamb, no freedom. No lamb, no Israel. No lamb, no Jerusalem. The angel of death came through Egypt on the 14th of Nisan, and many, many, many Egyptians were killed. Many people were killed. But whoever had cho uh, chosen a lamb on the 10th, and applied that blood and that meat to their household on the 14th, they watched as death passed over their family when this happened to Egypt. You can look even in, there's archaeological records now showing a, a major occurrence in the land of Egypt during this time period um, that without the Bible you wouldn't be able to understand what happened, but the economy collapsed through the death of a lot of livestock and animals, the population declined. Um, there's actually records of this, that some major catastrophic event took place in Egypt during this exact time period. Well, if you have the Old Testament, you know what that event was. And it almost collapsed Egypt, the powerhouse Egypt. And Pharaoh at the time said, he finally said to Israel, to Moses and the Israelites, he's like, just get out of here. Just go, I don't, I don't, I just be free, and, and your God is just too much. It's too much for us. In other words, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. This was the reason there were so many Jews in Jerusalem on that day that Jesus rode into town. They were there preparing to celebrate the Passover, to remember this event and to celebrate with each other. And while there is debate about whether or not Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a Sunday or a Monday or how his entry correlates to our modern calendar, one thing is for certain. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he rode in on the 10th of Nisan, according to the Jewish calendar at that time. And we know that for two reasons. Number one, John's gospel tells us that he had supper in Bethany, which was just two miles outside of town. It was where he was staying. He had supper in Bethany, 
on the evening of the ninth of Nisan. Then John writes this in John chapter 12, verse 12 and 13. He says, the next day, the tenth of Nisan, a great multitude that had come to the feast, that's Passover, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, he rode in on the 10th of Nisan, the day after the ninth. And some may, some may debate that passage, but for sure there's no debate in this. We know Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan because number two, what John the Baptist and the Apostle Paul said of Jesus. When John the Baptist saw Jesus, this is what he said in John chapter 1, verse 29. It says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world. John's declaration is that's the Lamb right there. That's the Lamb of God. Not just for Israel, but for the whole world. He's going to take away the sin of the whole world. In Paul's confirmation, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says this in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, the latter half of the, the, the verse. He says, For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrifice for us. So here are the two perspectives. The Jewish people who are in Jerusalem for Passover and the Jewish religious leaders who were administering the communal Passover, watched as Jesus rode into town, which, by the way, is a divine event in itself. Because, I mean, think about the ridiculousness of this story. Jesus is in Bethany, two miles away. He tells his, two of his disciples, hey, go into the town next to us, and there's going to be a colt, uh, uh, a donkey, a young donkey tied up, and go up to it and untie the donkey. And, if, and when someone comes and asks you, well, what are you doing? Just tell them the Lord needs it, and then bring that to me. I mean, that's a, that's a strange mission right there. The two disciples go to the town. It's probably Bethphage, and they go in there. Sure enough, there's a donkey tied up out, out in the public streets. Okay, so they go and they untie it. Sure enough, someone comes up and says, what are you doing? Why are you untying that donkey? And they say, the Lord needs it. And the person's like, oh, okay. I'm going to try that next time I want to drive a nice vehicle or something. Hey, the Lord needs it. Okay, go ahead. Here are the keys. I mean, it's, it's wild. It's divine. It's in it's the omniscience of Jesus, you know, in his deity, he, knowing these steps that need to be uh, uh, taken, that need to happen. So Jesus sits on this donkey. He rides into Jerusalem. And from the people's perspective, he's fulfilling the prophecies of becoming their king. He's the Lion of Judah. But what the people fail to recognize is that he's not riding up on a high horse into Jerusalem like the kings of the past or like a, like a mighty conqueror like Alexander the Great who rode a big high horse that no one could tame except him. He was riding down low on the back of a donkey. He wasn't there to fulfill the prophecies of the Lion of Judah. He was there to fulfill the prophecies of the Passover Lamb. The people chose him upon his entry to Jerusalem, and the priests chose to kill him. But what they failed to put together was that on the 10th of Nisan, when they were choosing him, they were primarily in town to choose a lamb. At the time that the people said, you are the one, and at the time that the priest said, you are the one we're going to kill, each family also had to look through their own flocks and choose a lamb and say, you are the one. And the priest had to approve and say, you are the one we're going to kill. The priest had to look through the flocks of the, for communal Israel and say, you are the one that is worthy to die for Passover. They did this on the 10th of Nisan, but they failed to notice the parallels between choosing a lamb from their flocks and choosing Jesus from among their own people. But they chose him. They chose him to be their lamb. And he was inspected intensely until the 14th. And that's what they did with the lamb, and that's what they did with Jesus. They chose Jesus from among themselves on the 10th, and they kept him in Jerusalem until the 14th. And as we read earlier in Mark's gospel and in the other gospel records, the chief priests came and they questioned him. And the scribes came and they 
they tried their, their, their opportunity in questioning him. And the Herodians came, and they questioned him. And group after group came inspecting this lamb. They don't realize what they're doing. They're trying to get him to trip up to prove he's not the king. He even went to Herod, and then Herod sent him over to Pilate. And you read some of that, you're like, why is he getting sent from person to person to person? There's some legalities behind it, but there's a spiritual, uh, divine, providential uh, aspect to this as well. Everybody had to inspect this lamb. He's going to die not just for the Jews, he's going to die for everyone. So he gets sent to Pontius Pilate, and in his final inspection in front of Pontius Pilate, he looks at him and he says, I find no fault in this man. He's a man without spot and without blemish. He was a man who was tempted at all points, just as we are, yet no sin. And because he was perfect, because he was without sin, because he was without blemish or defect, that made him the perfect man to die. Not just for the Jews, not just for Israel, but for all of us. Do you know that the Jewish people were only set free from bondage in Egypt because of a lamb? A little lamb set them free. Do you know that the Jewish people literally cheated death because of a lamb? I know it seems crazy, but God told them to choose the lamb, to kill the lamb, to take its blood and put it on the outside of their residency, and take the meat and put it on the inside. And because they did that, they were set free from bondage. They were released from slavery in Egypt, and they were sent to a promised land, all because of a lamb. I know that's very strange, but it worked. It worked. We have, the, we have the historical record. We have the proof today. But why that matters to us on this Sunday morning is because once Jesus was chosen on the 10th of Nisan, and once he was inspected by all the people, and once he was crucified, on the 14th of Nisan, now all of us, all of mankind, can be free from the bondage of sin. We can all be free from being enslaved to our flesh. We can all be set free from being enslaved to the spirits of this world. All of us can be set free from this crummy world that has held us hostage for so long. All of us can begin a journey of faith that will lead us to an eternal promised land that we often call heaven or the kingdom of God. We can cheat death similar to the way that Israel did 3,500 years ago. How do I know that? Because Jesus cheated death. Because he cheated death. They crucified him on the day of Passover, but on the third day of Passover, the day of first fruits, he came back. He came back from the dead. The lamb was chosen, killed, and buried, but then he came back from the dead and he passed over permanent death. He conquered permanent death. And he says to anyone who will believe me and follow after me, I will give you this same gift. I will give you this same opportunity to pass over from death into life. He tells us now here today that if we will receive him as our Passover lamb, if we will apply his blood to our residency, if we will internalize his substance, that we too, although we may die, we will be resurrected and pass over permanent death. How do we apply the blood and how do we eat the lamb? As our musicians come, how do we apply that today in 2024? Well, someone asked that question in Acts chapter 2, the first time the gospel was ever preached. Someone asked that question, what shall we do? How do I do that today? Even, you look through the book of Acts, Gentiles and Jews were asking that question. How do we do that? How do we put the blood on our life and how do we get the lamb on the inside? And Peter preached it in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, for the very first time. This is what he said, Acts chapter 2. He said, you need to repent that means confess your sins to God. Before you even repent, you have to have faith. So if you don't believe this message, if you don't believe that Jesus was who he said he was, then you're not going to repent. But if you believe that, you'll repent. You'll confess your sins to God. 
Say, Lord, forgive me. Help me. I want to be saved from death. I, I want to experience eternal life. I want this gift. I want death to pass over my, my life. Repent. Confess your sins. Then he said, let every one of you be baptized, water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. That's how we put the blood on our life. We don't have the blood of Jesus Christ today. But when we go down in water, we have a baptistry right back here. If you want to get baptized, you can be baptized this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. When we're baptized, we go underwater and we invoke the name of Jesus over our life. And that is symbolically putting the blood of the Lamb over us on the outside of our residency. As many as were baptized into Christ, the Bible says, have put on Christ. That's how we put the blood on the outside. What about getting the lamb on the inside? Peter says, repent. Every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And he says, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, if you pray and you ask God, God, who is spirit, will come inside of you and he will live inside of you. You will be filled with the Holy Spirit, so much so that the Spirit of God will begin to speak and express utterances out of your mouth in a language that you've never even spoken before. The Lamb will come and live inside of you and speak through you and begin to lead and guide and direct your life. This is how we put the blood of Jesus, the Passover Lamb, on the outside and on the inside of our life. You see, from people's perspective as you stand with me this morning. From people's perspective, the Jewish people's perspective, they were choosing a king. But from Jesus' perspective, he was letting them choose their lamb. He was letting them choose their lamb. You have to think about, put your mind into what Jesus saw when he rode into that city. I know a lot of the, the reenactments of, of this event, some of the children's, you know, books, children's Bibles, and some of the, the modern uh, reenactments that are on, on video or screen or DVD or whatever show Jesus riding in and everyone's cheering and he's high-fiving him and he's smiling and he loves it and he's shaking hands like a politician and he's just all excited. I don't think that's accurate. He's not riding in to be their king. He's going to be their king. And there's some symbolism there. There's some prophetic symbolism. But he's riding in there to be their lamb. They're thinking our king has come. But in their declaration of saying you're our king and in the Jewish religious leader's declaration of saying we're going to kill you, he knows what that means. That means I'm their lamb. They're choosing their lamb on the 10th of Nisan. And yet he saw that, he knew that, that he was being the chosen lamb, and yet he rode in anyways. And yet he allowed them to come at him for the next four days and inspect and interrogate and test him. And he did all of that for them. And he did all of that for us, for you and I, so that we could be set free. He was willingly giving himself over to his people, giving himself over to us. He did that so we could be free, so that someone could pay for our sins and so that we could have something to look forward to beyond this life. Brothers and sisters, friends that are here today, I encourage you, choose Jesus as your lamb this morning. Make him your chosen lamb. Put the blood on the outside. If you haven't been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, come find me after service or during the altar call, during our time of prayer, we'll baptize you. If you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, come up front and pray and ask God to fill you. He will fill you with the Holy Spirit. You will get the lamb on the inside of your life and you will know it because the Spirit will speak through you. Have the faith. Step out in faith. Put the blood on your life. Put the lamb on the inside and let God do a great work. Choose him today to be your Passover lamb on this poem. Sunday. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for coming in flesh, humbling yourself, lowering yourself for us to bring salvation to your people, to give us an opportunity to be forgiven for all the sins that we've committed, all the failures that we've experienced, to, to have a, a hope, a promise of eternal life to take us outside of this world. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for riding into that city knowing full well what that meant, that that meant that you'd be laying your life down for us. Lord, I pray that you would move in this place this morning, that you would move in a mighty way and that people would feel convicted and that souls would hunger and thirst for you and that we would get the revelation, a revelation through the Spirit from God of who you are and how we need you. In Jesus' name I pray, oh God, draw us to repentance. Draw us to baptism. Oh God, give us the faith to be filled with your Spirit and move in a mighty and powerful way today. We choose you, Lord. We choose you to be our Lamb. There's no other way of salvation. There is no other path. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And we do not come to the Father except by you. And we choose you today by faith. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I wonder if anyone feels that faith this morning. If you want to come forward, come and pray this morning. This area is up front is open to you. Please come. Reach out to the Lord. Let Him bless you. Let Him move upon the inside of your life this morning. If you've never repented of your sins, come forward and talk to God. Confess your sins. He laid down his life so he can forgive you. Come and reach out to him and let's celebrate what he's done for us this morning. In Jesus' name, why don't you come? In Jesus' name. 